going to go down to 22. So, our study of the book of Nahum. Yeah. And uh, we went through chapters 1 through 5 up to last yeah. session. I can't hear it. Sort of a, an addendum. About that. We talked, obviously, in Daniel chapter 5 with the fall of Babylon to the Persians. Historically, that happened in 539 BC. It's well documented. And many of your Bible helps, of course, will help you with that, except most of them make a mistake. Most of them assume, incorrectly, that Babylon was destroyed when it fell to the Persians. Quite the contrary. They took it over without a battle. And it's, I, I mentioned that not to disparage many of the good helps that are around, but you will discover that most of them fall in the trap of assuming that the fall of Babylon and the doom of Babylon are the same thing. And so because of that, we're going to devote this session to talking about what really happened to Babylon since that fall, and because it turns out not just a question of correcting an erroneous history, but it has profound implications for each one of us in this room, and in fact, gives us one of those marvelous chances to test our hermeneutics, to put in a, to an empirical test to our theories of interpretation. This is very dear to me for a lot of reasons, because I grew up uh, uh, very interested in the Word of God in the 40s. I, I, I got very interested as a teenager. And uh, in those days, I can remember the debates among good scholars about whether Israel would ever be back in the land. Some of you are old enough to remember, and some of you may be too old to remember, uh, during World War II, um, there were some commentators that felt that Hitler was the Antichrist, and they, they would pick that view. But there were a few, M. R. D. Hahn, Ironside, and several others, that said no matter how it looks, it couldn't be the Antichrist because Israel was not in the land. Yeah. They knew their Bible well enough to know that was a precondition to what we call the end times. Now, those debates were quite intense. People who took the Bible literally, seriously, as the way I express it, recognized that Israel was yet to actually return to the land of Israel. Uh, some of the liberals, modernists, most of the denominations, felt that, well, that's just all allegorical, and so they had their, they had their various ways of, of trying to get around that. Well, on May 14th of 1948, when Israel, when, when David Ben-Gurion, using Ezekiel as his authority, declared the name of the new Jewish homeland as Israel. That should have ended the debate. Those of us that took the Bible literally rejoiced because that was exactly what was expected for 2,000 years, or better part thereof. We face a similar situation today. There are really good scholars that disparage the, any, any implications or, or relevance to the fact that Saddam Hussein was, has been rebuilding Babylon. You're going to see why in this session we take a different view. And our view, I think, is going to also lead to an opportunity to test our perception of, of the end time scenario. So we're going to talk about not the fall of Babylon, that was last time, the mystery of Babylon this time. And this is like an addendum to the last chapter. In this session, we're going to go from the fall of Babylon last time to the doom of Babylon as it is prophesied in Isaiah 13 and 14, Jeremiah 15 and 51, and Revelation 17 and 18. And most of you recall that I encouraged you uh, sometime this past week to read those six chapters. There are three pairs. Each one, there are three pairs of chapters. And to read them in one sitting so that the language is fresh in your mind and come to your own conclusions. And then we're going to talk, having done that, we're going to take, talk about what's going on in Babylon today and what we suspect will occur in the coming months. And the most important city in Iraq is rarely mentioned in the news as the most important city. It's not Baghdad. It's Babylon. You'll see why in a minute. So we're going to look at the doom of Babylon here. Well, last time the Persians took over, you recall, Belshazzar threw his party. A handwriting on the wall showed up, which shook him up. Daniel interpreted it for him. And while that was going on, the Persian army had previously gotten control of the Euphrates upriver and diverted it so the river that fed Babylon's moat and other things dropped. And, the, and as Herodotus records, they slipped in under the gates, took the city over. 
there are actually records that indicate that the, some of the residents of the city for, didn't even know it for three days. It was more like a coup d'etat rather than an armed war. In fact, you may recall that Cyrus in a cylinder of Cyrus brags to the world that he conquered Babylon without a battle. He claimed, in fact, among his many titles that he's now king of Babylon. He made his son Cambyses his viceroy in Babylon. And uh, things remained peaceful there for some time until Cyrus finally dies. And uh, Darius II takes over. And uh, uh, after him came some other guys that I won't try to pronounce their names, but they called themselves uh, Nebuchadnezzar III and IV. Uh, when Saddam Hussein call himself, calls himself Nebuchadnezzar II, I know he's making a point to an illiterate group, but actually if he's going to call himself a Nebuchadnezzar, it'd have to be fifth, because there's been several uh, between. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, about the fourth year of Xerxes, this is, the, this is the leader of the Persian Empire, during which the episodes of Esther take place, one of the most dramatic books in the Bible. And a uh, very interesting character, by the way. But anyway, uh, during his reign, the Babylonians made another attempt to gain their independence, but uh, they uh, uh, were quickly suppressed with much cruelty and damage uh, to Babylon. However, in 460 BC, Herodotus, this famous uh, writer who was known in, in literature as the father of history, very prolific writer, very important to the Greeks. Anyway, he visited and he, the city and he reported that it was virtually intact. Yes, damaged from the previous rebellion, but intact. Well, by about this time, Greece is on the rise, and by 331, Alexander, the, uh, the, the Great, as we call him, was welcomed by the Babylonians when he entered the city after his victory over the Medes in Gagamela, which really established him. This young man conquered the known world uh, in his 20s. He said at uh, 29, to have fallen his bed weeping, there were no more worlds left to conquer. He conquered all the way to India. He's a legend for many reasons, a very fascinating Indian, uh, character. And uh, he was acclaimed as king of Babylon. And nine years later, he had planned extensive renovations of Babylon. He was going to make a port for a thousand worships. Now, uh, it seems, that may seem strange to you, but if you look at a map, you know, it looks like it's very much inland, but it's very marshy. Apparently the concept was to have a massive dredging thing to, make, to create a port for Babylon. But he passes away. And, uh, in 323, and his four of his key generals divide the empire up. And that's going to be important to us as we get in later chapters in Daniel, we'll go through all that. Now his career, fascinatingly enough, is detailed in advance. Daniel lives to rise to power in Babylon, but he also then rises to power in the Persian Empire. We're going to talk about that in our next session. Some very dramatic episodes that occurred when the, the, the Persians took over, Daniel has occasion to rise to a similar role in the Persian Empire that he had in the Babylonian Empire. And that will be important for you to understand, not only to understand parts of Daniel, but most people do not understand what was going on at Christmas that when you celebrate the so-called three wise men, the Magi, what's that all about? Those, that, those, those trails lead back to Daniel. We'll talk about that next time. But the point is, um, Alexander, the, that comes after, Daniel's passed away by then. But Alexander's career is detailed in advance. And we're going to experience that when we get to Daniel chapter 8. Also, what's even more astonishing, his successors for the next 400 years are also detailed in advance. They speak of the 400 years between the Old and New Testaments as the silent years, because there are no books covering that period. Well, that's not quite true, actually. You'll discover that Daniel chapter 11, verses 5 through 35, detail the struggles between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies, which, of course, uh, in between which uh, Israel is a buffer state. So we'll talk about that when we get to Daniel 11. So the Greek Empire, you need to understand that Alexander made Babylon his capital. He died there. So Babylon was not destroyed by the Persians. It serves as a capital two centuries later. And the, the four generals divide up his empire. Cassander takes, took the, uh, the far west, Macedonia and Greece. Lysimachus took Thrace, Bithynia, and most of Asia Minor. Ptolemy took the south, which included Egypt, very powerful in those days, Cyrene and Arabia. 
And he, by the way, it was in, uh, uh, Ptolemy Philadelphus that sponsors the translation of the Hebrew scriptures into Greek, that what we call the Septuagint version, usually abbreviated LXX, which is a Roman numeral for 70, the Septuagint, which is a very, very valuable document because it, uh, for several reasons. First of all, it gives us a Greek perception by the best Hebrew scholars of that day as to what the Hebrew text says. Furthermore, it's the Septuagint that becomes the Christian's Bible during the New Testament period. Most of the quotes in the New Testament are quotes from the Septuagint version of the Old Testament. And uh, so there's much to you that's a very important thing to be aware of. Okay, and Seleucus, of course, took the Assyria all east all the way to India. Ptolemy and Seleucus are struggling then over the centuries over this ground between them, which of course includes Judea. And uh, one of the Seleucid emperors, or I should say kings, was Antiochus Epiphanes, Antiochus IV. He called himself uh, the uh, Epiphanes, the enchanted one, the, 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 the exalted one. Um, the kids on the street called him Epimenes, which means the madman. Uh, but he's the little horn. He's, uh, he's referred to as the little horn Daniel 8, and uh, we'll talk about that when we get there. But again, the silent years are profiled in the mass, as I emphasize. But the main, what happens next in the history of Babylon, it starts to atrophy. The Seleucids, the Seleucids created another city, on a little slightly more favorable, a better location for the uh, caravan routes. And so Babylon begins to get at, to atrophy. The trade is drawn to this other city. And so uh, the, the Babylon's on the Euphrates, Seleucid was on the river Tigris. Uh, between those two rivers is, by the way, what we call Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia means between those two rivers, between the rivers. Anyway, because this rival city is starting to prosper, it expedited the decline of the ancient metropolis of Babylon. But when you get to 75 AD, in the new, what I call this post-New Testament period, the merchants there are still trying to make a go of it. We have records of that. And in fact, when you get to a century later, or anyway, 115 AD, Emperor Trajan from Rome visits there. And 199 AD, uh, Septimus Severus, a subsequent emperor, reports, he visited there and, and reports that it's deserted. It's still there, not destroyed, but deserted. But when you get to the 19th century, a German archaeologist by the name of Robert Koldewey um, is very famous for having done some of the early excavations of ancient Babylon. He's able to hire locals. There are about 10,000 inhabitants there, and a village, a hill, it shows us a hill on the maps, but it's basically the ancient site of Babylon. When you look at the military maps of Desert Storm, down there in that area near Hilla, you see it says uh, uh, large ancient buildings. It's not labeled Babylon, but that's really what we're talking about. And so, so the mystery of Babylon, and it's more important for you and I, the prophetic destiny. You can look at the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, in a sense, like the tale of two cities. You have, in effect, Jerus Jerusalem, which is presented as the city of God, despite all its problems, and Babylon is the city of man, or some people even would call it the city of Satan. And uh, so this, the struggle between the two, the contrast between the two, at least idiomatically, is all through the scripture. Uh, Babylon is mentioned over 300 times in the Bible. It's alluded to three times in Christ's genealogy, strangely enough. And uh, it's, it was the capital. Here's part, one of the other things that I think is very important to keep in mind. It was the capital of the first world dictator, a guy by the name of Nimrod, which means we rebel. It's my suspicion personally, but it's just my conjecture, that it will again be the capital of the last world dictator, and who I'll just dub rhetorically here is Nimrod the second. But uh, the fall of Babylon, we saw last week, occurred without a battle, became Alexander's capital, atrophied over the centuries, presently re being rebuilt by Saddam Hussein. However, the passages in the Old Testament, in Isaiah and Jeremiah specifically, mention that it'll never, once it's destroyed, it's going to be destroyed rather dramatically, and once that happens, it'll never again be inhabited. The building materials will never be reused. In fact, both Isaiah and Jeremiah use this strange expression, it'll fall like Sodom and Gomorrah, which as you recall from Genesis 19, came down suddenly, catastrophically. So, and there's another issue that we'll touch on. We won't spend, we can spend a lot of time on, we'll just touch on. What about this 
strange thing that's called Mystery Babylon in Revelation. There it's used idiomatically in another way. Is that different? Some people say it is. Or is it both the same? I think both are true. And we'll show you why. In Isaiah 13, let's, uh, some issues we're going to see here before we get into this. What about Babylon today? That's one of the questions we're going to try to deal with. Will it be the capital for the final world dictator? And if that's so, what specifics should we be watching for? Most prophecy books that you may have seen uh, that have come out have overlooked some of these startling passages that will affect each of us over the coming months and years ahead. Let's just jump in and take a look at these passages. We're going to jump into Isaiah 13. We're not going to go into detail here. They're lengthy, but I, I want to skim through and give you a flavor. I want you to savor the taste. The, the text here. Isaiah 13, starting at verse 1, the burden of the Mosaic, of uh, Isaiah, the son of Amos, did see. Lift ye up the banner upon the high mountain, exalt the voice unto them, shake the hand, that they may go into the gates of the nobles. I have commanded my sanctified ones, I have also called my mighty ones for mine anger, Ooh. even them that rejoice in my highness. So God is calling his top brass into this picture here. The noise of a multitude in the mountains, like as of a great people, a tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts mustereth the host of the battle. Babylon fell on 539 to the Persians. Here we're talking about kingdoms and uh, of the nations. It's a much more worldwide concern, apparently. Verse 5. They come from a far country from the end of heaven, even the Lord, and the weapons of his indignation to do what? To destroy the whole land. Ooh. Howl ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. That's a very key phrase in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. The day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Therefore shall all hands be faint. Every man's heart shall melt. And they shall be afraid. Pangs and sorrows shall take hold of them. And they shall be in pain as a woman that traveleth. They shall be amazed at one another. And their faces shall be as flames. Behold, the, here it comes again, the day of the Lord. See, it said it a second time. The day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. This, of course, ties it with these passages in Joel and elsewhere where the day of the Lord is the primary theme of those passages. But I want you to notice verse 10. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened and is going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. There are some people who try to link this to nuclear winter and so forth. That's maybe going a bit far. But in any case, it certainly is something that gets everyone's attention. And it certainly is not stuff that happened back in 539 when the Persians slipped in and took over. Verse 11. And I will punish the world. Ooh. I will punish the world for their evil. And the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. And will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. You know, it's interesting, it's important to be sensitive to how God hates pride, mm -hmm. how he hates the arrogant. Mm -hmm. It astonishes me to find people in the Christian ministry that are unabashedly arrogant. Mm -hmm. I'm surrounded by some good friends who promise to take me apart if I start taking myself seriously. I listen to some of these people on the radio and I'm astonished, not just because I may have some difference of opinion, but for the mean-spirited arrogance that characterizes certain ministries. It's amazing to me. I will make man more precious than fine gold, even a man, than the golden wedge of Ophir. Therefore I will shake the heavens, get this, and the earth shall remove out of her place. Boy, that caught my eye many years ago when I had a superficial participation in a study by one of the government contractors, which was uh, to, to determine the impacts of a gigaton weapon. It turns out it would alter the orbit of the earth. Um, in the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger, it shall be as the chaste road, as the sheep that no man taketh up, that they shall every man turn to his own people, and flee every one into his own land. Everyone that is found shall be thrust through. Ooh. Everyone that is joined unto them shall fall by the sword. Their children also shall be dashed to pieces before their eyes. Their houses shall be spoiled, and their wives ravished. Behold, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver, or as for gold, they shall not delight in it. 
In other words, they won't be money motivated. Now, because the Medes are mentioned here, causes many scholars to assume this relates then to the Medes and the Persians back in 539. And that's understandable if there was no other evidence. From all the other evidence, clearly this did, was not referring to what happened back in 539, but then who are the Medes? And many scholars believe that the Medes are the Kurds. And so it's interesting, the Kurds do indeed have major hostility towards Iraq, the leadership in Iraq. They were the Kurds that were gassed. You know, Saddam Hussein used chemical weapons against his own people, those that were not ethnically in step with his program. So the Medes had some deep, some deep uh, uh, hostility here, obviously. Their bow shall they dash the young men to pieces. They shall have no pity on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes shall not spare children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldees' excellency. That's an important phrase, by the way. This is Babylon on the banks of the Euphrates. It's a Chaldean entity. It's not an idiom for New York or for Rome. This is, it, it, this is uh, uh, understood by, the, by, by uh, Isaiah and Jeremiah to be Chaldean in its, in its makeup. The beauty of the Chaldean's excellency shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Both Isaiah and Jeremiah will make that allusion. Here's a key phrase. It shall never be inhabited. Neither shall it be dwelt in from generation to generation. Neither shall the Arabian pitch tent there. Neither shall the shepherds make their fold there. That's an interesting phrase, by the way, because... Babylon is nowhere near Arabia. The dominance of Arabia is implicit in this picture. I think that's kind of interesting. But the main point is you get the impression that it's not inhabitable. That certainly is not true through the centuries. It still is. So whatever is going on here hasn't happened yet. That's the main point I'm trying to, to uh, put before us here. Let's continue. But the wild beasts of the desert shall lie there, and their houses shall be full of doleful creatures, and owls shall dwell there, and satyrs shall dance there. And by the way, these, 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 this language in the Hebrew is often, not always, but often used of demons. Mm -hmm. These may be idiomatic uses of these terms. But anyway, let's move on. And the wild beasts of the island shall cry in their desolate houses, and the dragons in their pleasant palaces. And her time is near to come, and her day shall not be prolonged. So let's the next chapter continue. For the Lord will have mercy on Jacob, and, yet, and will yet choose Israel. And sent them in their own land. Really? Yes. And the strangers shall be joined with them, and they shall cleave to the house of Jacob. And the people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids, and they shall take them captives whose captives they were, and they shall rule over their oppressors. In the year that King Ahaz died was this burden. Rejoice not thou, whole Palestina, by the way, I skipped a, a chunk here. There's a whole section I've skipped that hap it, it, where, where Isaiah focuses on the origin of Satan. And uh, uh, it's familiar to most of you, but in order, uh, I, because it is, I just went, I skipped ahead here. Rejoice not thou, whole Palestina, Palestine, interesting. I wonder how it knew, how Isaiah knew it was going to be renamed by the Romans. Isn't that interesting? Because the rod of him that smote thee is broken, for out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be the fiery, a fiery flying serpent. And the firstborn of the poor shall feed, and the needy shall lie down in safety, and I will kill thy root with famine, and he shall slay thy remnant. How, O gate, cry, O city, thou whole Palestina, art dissolved, for there shall come from the north a smoke, and none shall be alone in his appointed times. What shall one then answer the messengers of the nation that the Lord hath found in Zion, and the poor of his people shall trust in it. Well, and it goes on. Let's, let's take a look at Jeremiah. And it's Jeremiah passage, 15 through 1, is lengthier. I'll do just most of the excerpts because we go through this. The word of the Lord is spake against Babylon and against the land of the Chaldeans by Jeremiah the prophet. Notice that again. It's Babylon and against the land of Chaldeans. So Babylon is not being used here as an idiom or a symbol of New York or America or London or Paris or, or Rome or whatever. Um, Declare ye among the nations and publish and set up a standard, publish and conceal not. Say, Babylon is taken. 
Bel is confounded. Merodach, that's the one, these are their gods, is broken in pieces, or idols are confounded, or images broken in pieces. For out of the north there cometh up a nation against her, which shall make her land desolate, and none shall dwell therein. They shall remove, they shall depart, both man and beast. In those days, and at that time, saith the Lord, the children of Israel shall come, they and the children of Judah together, going and weeping, they shall go and seek the Lord their God. That's exciting. See, Israel is in the land when this is going on. For lo, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations. This is a global deal here. Assembly of great nations from the north country. And they shall set themselves in array against her. From then she shall be taken. Their arrow shall be as of a mighty expert man. None shall return in vain. I have read verse 9 many times. It's only recently that it has been pointed out to me by some Hebrew grammatical experts what it's really saying in that last phrase. From then shall she be taken. Their arrows shall be as of a mighty expert man. When you read that, you think, well, it's talking about the shooter. No, it's talking about the arrows. None shall return to me. The word arrow is katis. It's, a, it's but it refers to something shot from an engine of war, like, or from a bow by hand, if you will. Therefore, it's typically viewed, obviously, as an arrow. It could be other things. The Septuagint, that is the Greek, it's a noun, nominative, feminine, singular, common. It's a missile or anything thrown, such as an arrow or javelin, okay? And by the way, do you know what the uh, defensive missile of Israel is called? The arrow. Arrow 2 at this point. But it's this other phrase I want to highlight to you, as of a mighty expert man. The word is sakal. It means to be prudent, circumspect, wisely understand, and prosper. That's what the word means. It's a hefil participle masculine singular absolute, which means in effect it refers to the arrow. The arrow will have insight. The arrow will give attention to, consider, ponder, be prudent, and have comprehension. The arrow is a smart arrow. The Greek translation of this, it means intelligent or possessing understanding. This arrow that's being shot is an intelligent weapon. Now, it's it, so you don't misunderstand this, Jeremiah adds, none shall return in vain. In other words, these things can't miss. In the New American Standard, it says their arrows shall be like an expert warrior who does not return empty-handed. That is, the arrows don't return empty-handed. Their arrows shall be, in the NIV, the arrows shall be like skilled warriors who do not return empty-handed. It, it's, it's not the skill of the archer. It's a characteristic of the arrow. The intelligence in the arrow. They can't miss. This is really, interestingly enough, an intelligent, a, a, a technology statement. I need to collect these. I think they're fascinating. There are technology statements all through the scripture. And uh, this is one of them. We're talking about smart bombs, smart missiles, whatever. Let's move on. Verse 13. Because of the wrath of the Lord, it shall not be inhabited, but it shall be wholly desolate. Everyone that goeth by Babylon shall be astonished and hiss in all our plagues. Put yourselves in array against Babylon round about. All ye that bend the bow, shoot at her. Spare no arrows, for she hath sinned against the Lord. Skipping down a little further, and I will bring Israel again to his habitation. He shall feed on Carmel and on Bashan, and his soul shall be satisfied by Mount Ephraim and Gilead. In those days and at that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. And the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. Praise God for that. And I have laid a snare for thee, and thou art also taken, O Babylon. Thou, hast, thou wast not aware. Thou art found, thou art also caught, because thou hast striven against the Lord. The Lord hath opened his armory, and hath brought forth the weapons of his indignation. Oh boy. And for this is the work of the Lord God of hosts in the land of the Chaldeans. There it is again. This is clearly uh, very provincial here. Therefore, the wild beasts of the desert with the wild beasts of the islands shall dwell there, and the owls shall dwell therein, and it shall be no more inhabited forever. It shall be no more inhabited forever, Jeremiah says. Neither shall it be dwelling from generation to generation. As God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah and the neighbor cities thereof, saith the Lord, so shall no man abide there, neither shall any son of man dwell therein. Behold, a people shall come from the north, and a great nation, many kings, shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth, and they shall hold the bow in the lance, and they are cruel, and they will not show mercy. Their voice shall roar like the sea, and they shall ride upon horses, everyone, put in array like a man to the battle against thee, O daughter of Babylon. 
And then Prayer 51 continues, And Israel hath not been forsaken, nor Judah his God, of the Lord of hosts, though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Though their land was filled with sin against the Holy One of Israel. Interesting. Flee out of the midst of Babylon, deliver every man his soul, but be, be not caught off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He will render unto her a recompense. Babylon has been a golden cup. Ooh, that's interesting. That echoes in the book of Revelation when we read that part. Babylon has been a golden cup in the Lord's hand, and he hath made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine, therefore the nations are mad. Babylon has suddenly fallen and destroyed. Howl at for her. Take bomb for her pain, if so be she may be healed. I will also break in pieces, and with thee the shepherd and his flock. And with thee will I break in pieces the husbandman and his yoke of oxen, and with thee, and with thee will I break in pieces captains and rulers. And I will render unto Babylon and to all the inhabitants of Chaldea all their evil that they have done in Zion in your sight with the Lord. Behold, I am against thee, O destroying mountains, saith the Lord, which destroyeth all the earth. Oh boy. And I will stretch out mine hand upon thee, I will roll thee down from the rocks, I will make thee a burnt mountain. They will not take of thee a stone for a corner, nor a stone for the foundations, but thou shalt be desolate forever, saith the Lord. Set ye up a standard in the land, blow the trumpet among the nations, prepare the nations against her, call together against the kingdom of Ararat, Mini, and Ashkenaz, appoint a captain against her, cause, cause the horses to come up as the rough caterpillars. That's interesting. Prepare against her, ye nations, with kings and the Medes, that captains thereof, and all the rulers thereof, all the land of his dominion. The land shall tremble in sorrow for every purpose of the Lord shall be before he gets Babylon to make the land of Babylon a desolation without an inhabitant. That's not true today. The mighty men of Babylon have for, foreborn to fight. They have remained in their holes. Their might have failed. They became as women. They have burned her, her dwelling places. Her bars are broken. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, the daughter of Babylon is like a threshing floor. It is time to thrash her, yet a little while, and the time of her harvest shall come. That's an idiom very frequently used in the Old Testament of what we call the Great Tribulation. Mm -hmm. It's very provocative to me that in the book of Ruth, Ruth, who is a, the Gentile bride of the kinsman redeemer, is at his feet in chapter 3 during the thrashing floor scene. I think that's exciting. Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, hath devoured me, he hath crushed me, he hath made me an empty vessel, he hath swallowed me up like a dragon, he hath filled his belly with my delicates, he hath cast me out. And Babylon shall become a heap, a dwelling place for dragons, and astonishment and hissing without an inhabitant. And it goes on, but obviously this whole vein as we keep going here. And how, and, and how is Shishak taken? The word Shishak, by the way, happens to be an example of... Uh, of uh, encryption at Bosch. Uh, and it's just a kind of historical nodding that people are studying encryption, but it's provocative here for some uh, supernatural reasons. Let's move on. And how is the praise of the whole earth surprised? How is Babylon become an astonishment among the nations? The sea has come up upon Babylon. She is covered with the multitude of the waves thereof. Her cities are a desolation, a dry land, and a wilderness, a land wherein no man dwelleth, and so on. Pretty much it, 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 it keeps up this way. The doom of Babylon. The fall of Babylon 539, without a battle, became a capital, atrophied over the centuries, and is presently being rebuilt. The destruction of Babylon in the Old Testament emphasizes it will never be inhabited, the building materials will never be reused, like Sodom and Gomorrah. Do, do you see that they're different? That gives us, as a, 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 our, in our hermeneutics, a theory of interpretation, a difficulty. Either you've got to allegorize somehow this language as applying to things that happened in the past, which we find uh, inappropriate. Or this is something yet to happen in the future. Now for it to happen in the future means that Babylon has to rise to be once again a major power center to receive this judgment. And therein lies the, the, uh, the challenge here. And Mystery Babylon Revelation being part of that. If you, if you, make, you, can, you can make your own chart if you want where you take these six chapters, Isaiah 13, 14, Jeremiah 15, 51, and Revelation 17, 18, and make a list of the attributes or emphases that you find here. Many nations attacking is all through here. Israel's in the land and forgiven. Both Isaiah and Jeremiah allude to that. Uh, and and, and uh, like Sodom and Gomorrah, 
Isaiah 13, 19 and Jeremiah 50, 40, both make use of that phrase. Isaiah and Jeremiah emphasize never to be inhabited. The bricks are never, in fact, the bricks will never be reused, according to Jeremiah. And when does this all happen? During the day of the Lord. And all of this ties, of course, to the book of Revelation, but it's a literal Chaldean Babylon, not, a, not an idiom for some metropolitan you know, financial center present today. And of course, the, there are these strange allusions to the king's fornication, being drunk with wine, and a scarlet, purple, and golden cup. Those are all phrases that come out of Jeremiah uh, 51, verse 7, but also are amplified in Revelation in, in half a dozen verses. So let's take a quick look at just part of the book of Revelation, which speaks of in a slightly different idiom, and yet they overlap somewhat. Revelation 17, there came up one of the seven angels, which had seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, and I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth on many waters, whom, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. This is the mother of harlots here, we're going to see. And uh, many commentators see all kinds of reasons that this seems to fit, in some respects, the Roman Catholic Church. Now, you may be offended at that. I encourage you, to, if you want to explore that, there are many places to do that. Alexander Hislop did a classic study back in the 1800s. But the, the, by far, the best study out is David Hunt's book, A Woman Rides the Beast. Mm -hmm. And he titles it that way because he wants to emphasize the woman is not the beast. She rides the beast. The woman is the whore here described. And she takes advantage of the world system. But that world system, at the end, turns and consumes her. So don't confuse the two. But here he's talking about the judgment of the great whore that sits by many waters. And, and, and fornication is often used all through the Bible to allude to false worship. Yeah. Not just in a denotative sexual sense, as we would use the term. In a broader sense, it's used of, a, of, a, of a false worship. And uh, kings of the earth have committed fornication. The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. And he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast. We believe that's the beast that's also described in Revelation 13. A scarlet colored beast full of names and blasphemy and having seven heads and ten horns. And there's the connector, if you will, to the, the idioms that are used in Revelation 13. And the woman is arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations. Notice the colors. See the colors? Purple, scarlet, the deck and golden pearls. That's the color of the Roman Pope. And the cardinals wear the scarlet coat. The Pope wears a, uh, the, not only at times a scarlet and a white, but he has a purple robe. That is the same that the Roman emperors wore. It just morphed. The Roman Empire, as he'll discuss here, as we go through Daniel, never ceased to exist either. It was never overtaken. Mm -hmm. It just kind of went and was absorbed by, actually, political Rome was absorbed by religious Rome. Mm -hmm. And I think, um, and I can't remember the term that theologians use, but a lot of these scriptures, um, it's interesting, where physical Babylon is has never been totally wiped out and destroyed. I don't see it because I don't think there's enough timeline for it to become a world center as we would think of trade like New York. But while he was talking, could it be possibly the world center of the demonic power again? Follow me? You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Everything that's taking place in our physical world is taking place right now, right across the veil. So when there's wars being fought here on earth, oftentimes, probably most of the time, if not all the time, on the spiritual side, there's Satan's fallen angels are fighting against God's angels. This war has been going on ever since he re rebelled against God and drew one third of the angels with him. So just as maybe New York and I think especially the Roman Catholic Church in D.C., as you'll learn tomorrow, I think will be geopolitical and where Roman Catholicism, because it's clear there's only been one nation in the world that's ever been considered the city of seven hills for centuries, actually millennium, 
But even more importantly, the Holy Spirit said, John, you know that city she sets on the, the seven hills. Uh, that rules the world. Well, John was when? The first century after, and, you know, after the birth of Christ. Who was the world power then? Rome. 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 For the next 400 years will be the world power. So it has to be that is the religious center. And the Pope, the way he's doing all the things, he's, and it's interesting, if you don't understand it, how many ever heard the, the term black Pope? You never know had? No, we yeah. haven't either. Yeah. There's yes. always been two Popes. The white Pope's the one that we see. The Jesuits have had the black Pope, who is the power behind the Pope. Notice what this Pope is. Do we know the black Pope? Jesuit. He's a Jesuit. The first Jesuit ever be Pope. To sit, to be ever Pope. So he's the white Pope and the black Pope combined. The one that's in there now. Yes. Really? He's very evil. He's very about, he's, he's the one that's pushing to take away all our property rights and the Great Reset. And also um, trying to bring all religions. All well, religions underneath. He the, is. And they've been doing that for years. Yeah. Anybody remember Pope John Paul II? And they thought what a great Pope he was. Well, he was a Mariologist. He worshipped Mary. In fact, he died with the scapulum, which was to guarantee his entrance into heaven without going through purgatory. But in the... Uh, holy underwear. Yeah. The last, which <laughs> well, is very similar. I'm going to start selling holy underwear here. <laughs> which is very similar. Guaranteed if you don't think about Mormonism, they have sacred underwear too. Yes. Romney wears that. It's the same thing. But they come from the same fountain. Mm -hmm. It's corrupt. It's evil. But now think about this. You have, what I meant by, you have religious Rome, you have geopolitical Rome, but Babylon could very well be the seat of the demonic powers at the same time. So that may be why it will be utterly destroyed. Um, because it, you can trace the Babylonian religion was absorbed by Rome. In fact, they had a secret society that practiced the same thing going all the way back through Egypt, all the way back to Nimrod. Where was Nimrod? Babylon. Babylon. And that's all. That's what Freemasonry. It all goes back, not just to Egypt, all the way back to Nimrod. Hmm. So you're seeing all this. Also, this Pope is his, his doctorate uh, is in astrobiology, which is the study of alien life forms. He will be the one that will point to these. Are, remember, one of his first encyclicals was that we would have to uh, baptize them into the faith. Then six months later, and he's been a pontiff now, what, six years? Six months later, he said, no, they would be more spiritually evolved as well as genetically involved, so they would baptize us into the new religion. What does that sound what, like? What, the aliens? Yeah. yeah. Like that? Now, what does that sound like? That's taking the mark of the beast. Yeah. Because that alters your DNA, because I believe that the Antichrist will be some type of a hybrid form of cell. He may not start out that way, but he becomes that way. <laughs> because it all goes back to the seed. Remember in Genesis 3.15? And some scholars will say, well, Satan's seed does, means that it's just men who follow him. No, the Hebrew specifically, that seed means the very DNA that makes us able to procreate. Um, you had to see the woman. That would be Jesus came to receive the woman, humanity. And then you had, Satan has a seed. I think that those who take the mark and actually become one with their father. We become one with ours. Somehow we've already got a down payment. Because genetically, everybody who claims to be born again, scientists did a thing on this, and it, and it devolved into this. But they noticed that when they were mapping people's brains, um, then someone decided to, because uh, it started out with the cannibalistic tribes of, um, is it New Zealand or some of those other countries? Papua New Guinea, I believe. Yeah, it was New Guinea. Over the centuries, their DNA has changed because of cannibalism. Mm -hmm. It's, they're not like genetically exactly like everybody else. So they started expanding it to other groups. And then they got into, well, under, as they're mapped the brain, they start doing all the religions who pray. Now, when you and I are talking like this, you're listening, I'm talking, the part of your brain that communicates speech and what you hear and thought process, it just, in each one of your brains, you all got a brain, right now the synapses are firing. Because I'm talking, you're listening and you're thinking at the same time. 
So they did uh, MRIs while people were praying. They did every religion. Or at least the major ones. But you yeah. Have to yeah. 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 It was Here's what it was. You know, your brain's dead. You're talking. There's no communication right there. Then they even did Christianity. Except they started doing subsets. They did subsets of different uh, religions, other major religions. When they got to the subset of born again Christian, which is us. Now speak about this. When they were praying to God, boom! That frontal cortex was all alive. And that only happens not just when you're talking. That doesn't come alive until you're communicating. Yeah. And isn't that interesting? Well, think about this. Paul said we're a new creation in Christ. They also said our genetic, those who claim a born again experience, their genetic makeup is just a little bit different already. Not, you're, you're still human, I don't mean that. Uh, you understand? Oh my God! <laughs> but, but here's where I'm going with this. Let's take it to the next logical steps. When do we when do we get a new body? The, uh, At the resurrection. In the rapture did the same event. Then we have a body like Jesus' body. Never be like uh, anybody, even natural humans born into the millennial reign and on into the new heavens, new earth. We'll never have a body like Jesus' body. That's only the church. That's only his bride. We're the body. We're, in fact, Paul said we are flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone. Not blood, because Jesus' glorified body has no blood. But he eats and he talks and he sleeps. It's a real body. We are going to get a body 2.0, if you want to put it that way. It's a glorified body. I think that's when we are now, genetically, have the same body, human body, not God. We never have any essence of God because we were created. Because it all goes back to Jesus was the second Adam. He redeemed Adam's race, that Adam plunged into sin. So we're going to have the same type of body that Jesus has and now for eternity ever will have. He rules throughout eternity with the skull, uh, the, the nail marks, the scars. I think they're still open wounds because remember Thomas put his fingers in. Do not believe, but they're there. He forever bears the, 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 the mark, trauma in the marks of Calvary. But we'll have a new body. But likewise, those who take the mark of the beast, they take on the DNA of their father, the devil. That's why they cannot underscore that. Those that take the mark cannot, cannot ever be redeemed. They are doomed to hell, the lake of fire for eternity because Jesus did not die to redeem fallen angels. He died to redeem man because man was the last thing God created, even higher than angels. We're only lower than the angels right now because of sin. But when we are got the full fruits of our redemption, we're fully redeemed now, but we don't have all the benefits. You still get sick? We're still aging. Well, I'm not, but you guys are. <laughs> <laughs> but James still lies from time to time, see? <laughs> that's the remark of the fallen. <laughs> but can you imagine? That's where this is going. So when you when you I don't see because we just don't have enough time left. And remember, this was done in 07. So now um, who's that? by great power such as, I don't know, the U.S. were to intervene in Iraq again and annex. That's interesting. That's, That's cool. possibilities, but I don't think there's time to move all the world's economic no, there. No, but, but it could annex, become, and it think of about this, um, the, the occulty yeah. power base of the world again. So, no, just something to think about. What's the town name now? What's huh? the city, what is the city called now? It's still called Bank. I mean, uh, yeah. it's just be like you and I going to Colonial Williamsburg okay. uh, as an analogy. Is, is, is that where Saddam Hussein was killed? No. no. He was hung and, um, well, he was lynched after his trial was over. Well, where did they find him? They found him. It wasn't in Babylon. Okay, I've got a question yeah. about the Pope. Wasn't he the Pope that took the place of the person who conceded yeah. being the Pope? And this is the first time, uh, right. so the first time in history there's been two white Popes and one black Pope uh, alive at the same time. You've always had the black Pope. 
when he's behind the scene. Now, here's something you have to understand about the Jesuit order. The Jesuit order is not a Christian order. They never were. The Jesuit order was founded by, uh, uh, what was his first name? I can't remember. But it was solely for the reason of destroying the Reformation and putting down that. I thought I turned this crazy thing off. Okay, another question about the Pope. Wasn't he the one also that was like was supposed to be the people's Pope? Like he lived a very um, yeah, he's, he's all style. about he's all about liberation theology. Liberation theology is communism. Yeah, like he didn't live in richness. Seems like I remember that when he took office. Like he lived very poorly and well, he's uh, not. Uh, he's uh, listen. Yeah. That's a lie. They never lived poorly. Yeah. Even our even our local parish priest, um, you had uh, two of them, Cobbyman and Trammell. Trammell, um, I heard years ago, after about ten years after, uh, he actually left the Catholic Church and got married, and I wouldn't be surprised if he got saved. But they lived in a five thousand square foot house with uh, basically servants. <laughs> And you don't own anything, but you don't owe anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You live like royalty. Okay. And when you climb up um, and become, start becoming a bishop and then archbishop, and then after that it's cardinal, I believe. Mm -hmm. And from the College of Cardinals comes the Pope. But uh, you don't live a poor, astute lifestyle. Now, you may have local parish priests that earn your third world countries. They're not going to, they're certainly going to live better than probably the most of the parishioners, yeah. but they're not going to live in the extravagance. But when you start climbing the hierarchy, it's... I've never heard of the black folk. Oh. And that's a person. And it's just, is he like behind because, the scenes? Yes, because the Jesuit, it's always a Jesuit. The Jesuits, you have to... Let me give you an idea what the Jesuit order is like. Anybody heard of the SS? Yes. The Nazism? Himmler based it on the Jesuit order. And the Jesuits are also based on, remember the Praetorian Guards that the Caesars had? Okay, the Praetorian Guard were always loyal to the Caesars. In other words, it's about 5,000. It was a legion. So The only legion allowed inside Rome. The only legion that allowed inside Rome, exactly. So they were very powerful, and uh, that's why it was hard to get. In fact, the only See, time... Police too. Huh? They were like the secret police. They were like the secret police. Well, the SS, just like the Jesuits, swore an oath of allegiance to one man, the emperor. The SS swore an oath of allegiance to one person, uh, probably two actually, Himmler, Himmler and Hitler, but Hitler being first. Hmm. So the, the, the Jesuit order is the armed force, the secret police force. The uh, spy network. Mm. Now, I'll give you just throw this out of the caveat. Remember Jimmy Stratton Swaggart's problems, right? Mm -hmm. Back years ago. Interesting enough, the woman that was stripping for him, you want to be start looking at uh, uh, conspiracy, theory. conspiracy theory, was raised all twelfth grade. She went to a Jesuit school. Well, that's interesting. Yep, isn't that interesting? And. Um, if you go back in the 80s, Jimmy Swagger was not, he was coming down hard on the Catholic Church, not the Catholics. In fact, I remember him saying one time, he had a guy who was a very wealthy man, he was coming and giving big sums of money to the to the Swagger's ministry, and he, and he finally told him, he said, I, I, I can't have you do this without letting you know, you need to get out of that church because there's salvation it's not in works, but he never would make that statement of faith and come. So Jim Swart quit taking his money <coughs> because he felt he was leaving him in a, with a false sense of security. Mm -hmm. But that's just something to ponder. And uh, you ever remember a guy by the name of uh, Jim Jones? Oh, yeah. yeah. Jim Jones. <laughs> All right. Suddenly so got that, right? <laughs> Guess where he went to school? For Jesuit years. school. He was a Jesuit. Wow. And Catholic before he became a 
saved in the Shem Castle Patch. If you want to have a good idea of what the Jesuit order is like, write this down. You can still get them. Get the Alberto series from Jack Chick Publications. You probably can't get them on Amazon. You have to go to Jack Chick because uh, I'm sure Amazon doesn't care. Yeah, Jeff Bezos is a fascist. And it's the Alberto <coughs> series. It's in comic book form. But the Catholic Church tried to say, no, that wasn't really a Jesuit. And we come to find out, yes, he was a Jesuit. All his papers are there. And it will give you an idea. The Jesuit order is just like we have the CIA. They're in every nation. There are people that you wouldn't even know was a Jesuit priest. And a lot of them will attend churches. And they even send women in. It's very much like, well, it's, it's, it's the occult. They're very occult like. They're very, not like they are. They're steeped in the occult. So something to be said. Mm -hmm. Give you a little over the book. That's really going to start getting interesting as we get into Babylon and Matthew. The mm -hmm. next slide is uh, Mr. Babylon uh, and the, rise, the whole rise of Ethan, the ten horns come up. So I've been listening to uh, Gary Stearman on Prophecy Watchers, and he's got an article um on the ten horns, and he thinks that there are the ten oligarchs. Could be the ten oligarchs. Like, like what we're seeing going on right now. We are seeing all this unplay before our eyes, but we just don't. You just don't. If you don't know the Bible well enough, you're not getting the puzzle not pieces and putting them all together. Right. And the oligarchs are um, the elites, the uh, now, uber wealthy. The, the yeah. Bill Gates. He thinks Jeff that that's who this is, and that they're, they're coming together. The fishy, right now. the richest yeah. man. Actually, right. and how the, can you? No, he just passed that guy. No, the richest one is Putin, but they can't they can't quantify it. But you know, Putin it. is an interesting person. I think he's going to have to be taken out for this new world order thing to because he's very openly against the new world order. Well, because he wants to run the world. He is taken out. It's called Ezekiel thirty-seven thirty-eight. Yeah, because they're, they're, everybody. And, and I want to say something about this, and then we need to get back. I want you to remember this. China, y'all listening? Yes. China does not take over the world. It's the Antichrist that attempts that. In fact, he defeats the kings of the East in three days. Well, he not, not, it doesn't say he defeats them. He defeats three kings that come up against him in, in just a That's very short time. But when he's about to totally annihilate the Jewish people, then he hears the rumblings of the kings of the East, which would be China, possibly even by then Japan, and even India, coming against him. But before, and there's, there's constantly warfare, but then towards the end, the, the demonic spirits, which are probably three of the strongest angels under Satan, go out and convince everybody to fight against who's coming back on white horse. So is that the way the Lord? Well, who is that? The Lord. It's Jesus with us. And, and, and have we ever in the history of the world seen the whole world coming together like it is right now? And it, it doesn't make sense. I still think for what the world, uh, what they're wanting and the least want for world power now is they want to destroy, and for it to, to work, they got to destroy the middle class, not only in America, but in in what we call yeah, the West. Just two weeks ago, they were talking about, that was on Fox News, not Alex Jones, mm -hmm. talking about a global world currency. Yeah. Kid you not. But now, think about this. That means to destroy the middle class, it's all got to become communism. Which is quickly what we're becoming. But I don't think that's going to happen. Because it never gets to where it's all a one world government. Even at the end, there's all, the Antichrist has failed to conquer the entire yeah, world. Sure. He gets on that side with him right at the end. But what's, what's uh, fallen human nature? Let's just say they are able to defeat Jesus. He, he has to go back to heaven and roll in the back and think, man, we got a rat. We got our word in <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? We're not but that can't happen. Even if but if it could, falls like bulldoze, beautiful. John, what would be the result? It's down here on earth. They would go back to fight one another, would they not? Because there's no honor among thieves. So if they somehow beat Jesus, 
He said, come back, set up his millennial kingdom. They go, okay, we beat him. Next thing you know, because of man's fallen nature, they'd be plotting, well, who's going to rule the world? Oh, sir. Mm -hmm. We'll just go right back to that. Mm -hmm. But that's not what's going to happen. So, anyway. Uh, I was going to say attitude. <laughs> attitude. Yeah, there's a saying in the New Age, I think, or in the culture, whatever, as above, so beneath. Yeah, that's what and, people. And you'll start seeing that. And uh, so the black folk, the black folk. What happens in heaven happens on, on earth. But in the, so in the occultism. Like Jesus said in the, in the prayer, uh, let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. So but that's it, where the occult gets that. Yeah, yeah they, they, said, they, said, they would hold counterfeits yes. Yes. Everything. Counterfeit everything. And if you look at it, even in their heart. Mm -hmm. Now what is in front of the, uh, what is in the nation's ball mm -hmm. on that big, it's a reflection time. Right. Yeah. You'll yeah. see that. Yeah. That's yeah. why there's a reflection. So then you got octopus here, as above, same right. below. As above, well, as, as above, same below. That's doing this. Everything. And then we, we you know, the, fame, so the old bath in that picture, that's that's all that means. That's yeah. all it's all in yeah. the squat box. Oh, yeah. And then they said on 9 11, the Twin Towers are reflection of each other, as above, so beneath. And then 11 is a reflection as opposed to, I mean, there's all kinds of things. Oh, if you start, if you, once you know what to look for, yeah, I'm just learning what to look for. Wow. Here, here's it's what I'm, everywhere. Here's what I'm going to say about conspiracy. Right, explain that. If they're all true. Um, that 90% of them are true. Because all you got to do is, who's the grand conspirator of them all? Satan. Start with him. Yeah. All right, go ahead, John. This vaccine is a it's, a. it's just getting people conditioned to receive them all. Yeah, we are all How much of time is left on this, John? And filthy, this is for fornication. So here are the idioms linked with, if you will, the Jeremiah passage. And upon her forehead was a name Babylon the Great. Just leave it in there and we'll start right here. And the abominations of the earth. All. Any thoughts or comments? Anything other than your pastor on the swear word? Yeah, I was 